also I'd like to introduce she doesn't need an introduction Justice Peggy Clinton Supreme Court of Florida she'll be talking to us today about merit retention A good afternoon <clears throat> and thank you for inviting me to uh, be a part of your uh, meeting here today and I think this is really a great time uh, to talk about our judicial branch of government. <clears throat> you know last week we had uh, Constitution Day and I hope that any of you who had an opportunity to speak ab about our Constitution I hope you had, took that opportunity and talked about Article uh, 3 of our um, federal constitution and Article 5 of our state constitution. Because if you look at all the surveys that are generally taken about civics, you will see that people know least about the judicial branch of government. But they certainly expect the judicial branch to be there when they need it. And they need and they want a fair and impartial judicial branch. You know, earlier this year, we also celebrated Law Day. And the theme this year uh, for Law Day was no courts, no justice, no freedom. Well, I would like to sort of paraphrase that and say, no fair and impartial courts, no justice, no freedom. And so I think that's what our merit retention really this year is about. Whether or not we want to and will continue to have fair and impartial courts in this state. You know, when the federal constitution uh, was written, uh, Article 3 was written uh, so that we had a judiciary, a federal judiciary, where judges were appointed uh, for life on good behavior. And I believe that that was done really because of how the judiciary was handled when this country was a part of Great Britain. If you go back and look at the Declaration of Independence, the columnist indictments against Great Britain, there is a portion of the Declaration that talks about the judicial branch. And they talk about how judges were beholden to King George for their tenure in office and for their pay. And so when the Constitution was drafted and Article 3 was drafted, the columnists had in mind that the judges would not be beholden to anyone for their tenure and their pay. Of course, there is a way to get rid of judges if they are not on good behavior. But when uh, the states did their judiciary, they were allowed to do their judiciaries in a different manner. They could do it the, the same way that the federal government did or in a different manner. Here in the state of Florida, we chose to have election of our trial court judges, our appellate court judges, our justices. And we went along in that system until the 1970s. And I would hope that some of you have read <clears throat> the book by Mike Martin Dykeman, which is called A Most Disorderly Court. And in that book, it talks about the scandal that occurred on the Florida Supreme Court in the 70s, corruption. There were four justices who were involved in that taking briefs and, uh, from parties outside of the normal process, trying to influence what went on in circuit court cases. Four justices involved. 
One justice died a fugitive from justice. So our then Governor Ruben Askew, the legislature of this state, and the people of the state of Florida decided they wanted a different method to deal with selection of appellate court judges and Supreme Court justices. I submit to you this new method was intended to make sure that just judges and justices were not beholden to anyone. It's a nonpartisan process where people are se selected on merit and should be retained on merit. Now the selection process, when there are openings on our courts, there's a lengthy application where they ask you your history from the time you were born until the day you turn in that application. You have to talk about your legal history. You have to give them names of opposing counsels and those that you have worked with and judges that you have appeared before. They actually call people and talk to them to find out if you have the demeanor to be a judge, if you have the kind of um, practices that they're looking for, if you have done good things or been active in your communities. They look at the whole person when they are looking at people for our appellate courts and our Supreme Court. And you go through that process, interviewed by our Judicial Nominating Committee, Commission, and that commission will then send three to six names to the governor, and then the governor will make a selection. Once uh, you have been appointed to the court, you then have to stand for merit retention. Now the first merit retention is the first general election after you have been in office for at least a year. So that's your first retention. And then every six years uh, thereafter. This will be the fourth merit retention that I have had. <clears throat> Now, what is the merit retention? That's the more difficult part about the scheme that we have in Florida. If we are to maintain the nonpartisan aspect of this, I would submit to you that, and I know all of you have read about uh, what happened uh, last week, we, we have to make sure that we keep this nonpartisan. If we are going to maintain a judiciary that is not beholden to anyone, uh, I would submit that our retention really is the functional equivalent of the uh, federal system of doing good behavior. It cannot mean whether or not you agree with every decision that a judge or a justice makes. Because you're not going to agree with every decision that anyone makes. And I, I would be a little bit afraid if you did. So it's not about whether or not you agree with every decision, but whether or not that person, first of all, is still of good character. And second of all, whether the person has discharged their obligations as a judge. And your obligation as a judge is to fairly and impartially determine every case that comes before you. And that is to look at the facts of the case, the law that is applicable to the case, any constitutional provision that is applicable and make a decision based on those factors and not on any other factor. Judges should not be thinking about whether or not this decision is going to be a popular decision or whether or not some group may oppose you because of a decision. We cannot have judges who are intimidated. 
you think back on our history of all the decisions that have been made that you may not have agreed with <clears throat> or that you may agree with, but others did not agree with. So how can it be about whether or not you agree or disagree? Because if you took a survey in this room, some you will agree with and some you wouldn't. It cannot be about that issue. It is about whether or not the judge has really discharged their obligations as a judge. Is that person fair and impartial? Did you come into the courtroom with a fair opportunity to present your case and know <clears throat> that your case was going to be decided on the facts and the law and no other factor? That's what a fair and impartial judiciary is all about. And so I am asking you, uh, I spoke in, in Tampa a few weeks ago, and <clears throat> the newspaper article that came out about it said that I talked for a long time about merit retention and voting, but I never asked for the vote. Well, I'm going to ask for the vote. <laughs> the yes vote <laughs> on November 6th. You know, and you're going to have to go down the ballot to look for my name, my colleague's name on the ballot. We come after all the partisan races. The nonpartisan races come after the partisan races. So you have to look down the ballot, keep going down the ballot. But I would submit to you that you need to even go beyond my name on the ballot. Do you know that on November 6th, you are going to be asked to vote on 12, 12 proposed amendments to our Constitution. You need to make sure you know what it is that these constitutional amendments are about, even before you go to the ballot, because I would submit most people are not going to read even the summaries of those 12 uh, constitutional amendments, proposed constitutional amendments. But these amendments cover everything from changes to our court system, to taxes, to health care, homestead. A lot of issues are in those 12 proposed amendments. I dare say that each of you will be asked by someone or even multiple people how they should vote on various things, especially judges. And they'll probably ask you about some of these proposed constitutional amendments. So you need to make sure that you know about them and you understand them so that you can talk to others about them. You know, there's generally in, <clears throat> in elections a, a large drop off from the top of the ballot to the bottom of the ballot and they anticipate anticipate there might be up to two million person drop off from the top of the ballot to the bottom of the ballot. That's a lot of people who are not voting on whether our constitution should be changed. That's a lot of people who are not voting on whether or not our judges should stay in office. There are a lot of, that's a lot of people who are not voting on other local issues. You need to make sure that you tell your family and your friends and your colleagues and anyone else that you touch how important it is not only to vote, but for vote for all of these kinds of issues because they affect you on a daily basis. It is important who's the president and it's important who's in Congress, but it's just as important, if not more important, who the local people are. So I think it's incumbent upon all of us to make ourselves aware of these and help others around us that we know are going to be asking us about them. It, it is vitally important. Merit retention, of course, is, is dear to my heart. I'm on the ballot. And two of my colleagues, Justice Periente and Justice Lewis, are on the ballot. So these issues are very important to us, but it should be important to you whether or not you consider yourself a Democrat or a Republican, a liberal or a conservative, whether you're a member of the Tea Party or whatever you call yourself. 
a fair and impartial judiciary should be important to you. And this, I submit, is an issue that crosses all party lines. Are we, in the state of Florida, going to have a fair and impartial judiciary with judges who are not afraid to make some hard decisions sometimes? So I'm asking your help about retention this year. I'm asking your help in voting, but not just in you voting, but getting the word out to others, to your clients, to your colleagues, and to your friends and family. This is very important. The judiciary of the state of Florida is an important issue. And we cannot leave it up to others. I cannot do it alone. I could talk to uh, m any number of groups in this state, and I have done so. But it takes all of you to help others to understand the importance of having a fair and impartial judiciary. So we are counting on you to help us make others understand just how important that is. Uh, again, I want to thank you for inviting me to be here. You know, this is the first place I lived when I came to Florida. I lived here in Bradenton for two years. Uh, my husband is a native, went to Lincoln High School. Uh, I don't think it's Lincoln High School anymore, but uh, it's a middle school, Lincoln Middle School now over in Palmetto. My husband went there when it was a high school. And we moved here for a couple of years from uh, 1978 to 1980. So I feel like I'm at least partially home. Uh, I, in fact, I consider the whole D second DCA area as my home because I was uh, five years on the District Court of Appeal before I was appointed to uh, the Supreme Court. So uh, I thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk to you and to be here and, and share your um, Bar Association luncheon. And if you have any questions, I'll be right over here finishing my brownie. Thank you. <laughs>